So folks, welcome. We are about to embark on an incredible journey. Uh, we are going to travel the distance required to get from New York uh, to Australia aboard a 125 foot Coast Guard cutter. But we're going to do it in a different way, zooming back and forth across the Labrador Sea. Um, this, the Ex Marion Expedition is truly one of the signature uh, events in, in the early history of physical oceanography, not only for the Coast Guard, but for the nation. And, and quoting Edward Iceberg Smith, who was a CO, one of the most interesting and successful undertakings by the US government at that time. And that is absolutely true. So this is kind of, uh, if you're a fan of Star Wars, you remember the first three Star Wars movies were, were in the middle, if you will. There were prequels. You understand where the heck Darth Vader came from, right? And then the sequels, you understand all of the things that would come after that. And so that's what this is. Um, the Marion Expedition was kind of in the middle of a whole bunch of other things that were happening, happening uh, with the International Ice Patrol, as well as uh, you know, the birth of physical, physical oceanography, both for the Coast Guard and the nation. So some of the prequels, I mean, you know, the loss of the RMS Titanic, the birth of the International Ice Patrol, the early work, uh, understanding what was going on with icebergs as far as oceanographic studies go from A.L. Thuris and others. And then the sequels are kind of after this, the, the Marion proved the value of this and the Cutter General Green would go forth into uh, the, the, the coastlines of, of uh, Greenland and, and do much more work. Uh, Floyd Houle, a civilian oceanographer would join the ice patrol effort and uh, you know his works are uh, is as valuable as what uh, Iceberg Smith did, and then the whole Kaufman Agreement would come along where the where the America would decide that they were going to be able to um, uh, defend, if you will, uh, Greenland during World War II and the birth of the Greenland Patrol and all of that stuff that went on, starting with the with the Marion Expedition, would give that uh, baseline of information that the Coast Guard would use uh, to be the uh, military service that would be able to carry out the Greenland Patrol. The pictures you see are of, you know, one of the early cutters on Ice Patrol and then of course the lower one is the, the famous cutter Northland. So setting the scene, the International Ice Patrol was suspended uh, after World War, after or during World War I, 1917 to 1918. Um, it started obviously with the, the loss of the Titanic and it was governed by the US through the Interdepartmental Board of International Services of Ice Observation, Ice Patrol and Ocean Derelict Destruction. And I could do a whole nother 20 minutes on that Ocean Derelict Destruction thing. It's, it's a cool story. But um, I have uh, uh, Admiral Bertoff off because, up on the screen because at least twice he used um, the International Ice Patrol mission to basically save the Coast Guard. Um, you know, he assumed the uh, Ice Patrol mission, if you will, after the, after the Navy had started it after the loss of the Titanic, they took it over that next year. And he, you know, it was like the right thing to do for the Coast Guard. And some of that is based on the fact that, you know, he had all this experience uh, from his days in the Arctic on the other coast if you will, in the, with the Bering Sea Patrol and all the things that were going on in Alaska that are, is an important part of, of Coast Guard history. But he was the chairman of this committee, which was established by President Wilson back in, in 1916. And after the war, he said, you know, we need, to, we need to get this thing going again. And he also used that Ice Patrol mission to bring the Coast Guard back out of the Navy at the end of, uh, of World War I. So a couple of times the Ice Patrol and that mission would be incredible, incredibly important to, uh, you know, just the history of the survival of the service as we know it. So again, more setting the scene. In, in November of 1919, Lieutenant J.G. Edward H. Smith would be assigned to the Cutter Seneca, uh, a vessel specifically designed for uh, derelict destruction, uh, if you will. So that's a whole nother 20 minute story all by itself. 
And in spring, in spring of 1920, he would deploy with Seneca as the, as, uh, on the ice patrol mission as the navigator and scientific officer. And that's where he would really get rolling on under, trying to understand the oceanographic uh, influences and uh, things that propelled icebergs into the, into the shipping lanes in the North Atlantic. And this is where he would discover that, so the typical ice patrol mission would be you assign two cutters and they would be uh, deployed and based out of uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And they would spend a couple weeks on patrol trying to define the limits of known ice, trying to track that most Southern iceberg and put out warnings to ships. And then they uh, would go in for two weeks and the other guy, the other ship would take over. Well, you know, Iceberg Smith uh, quickly realized that, you know, he was losing a lot of things by going, being off station for a couple of weeks. So, you know, he kind of like said, you know, it'd be better off if we transferred that, that science officer, that oceanographic officer from ship to ship. And so that person was out there the whole time. And I'm sure that some of the folks who followed him after that were like, what? You know, I mean, I've got to, I've got to just transfer from vessel to vessel and stay on station for the entire uh, length of the season. But that would become the model and, and it would go from there. And so uh, that would trigger uh, an understanding of how important oceanography was to uh, the International Ice Patrol and understanding what was going on uh, on the Grand Banks and north of that. And as an outcrop of that, um, they would establish the first Coast Guard oceanographic unit in, uh, at Harvard University in 1923. And when they established it in 1923, it would have a civilian oceanographer, a military oceanographer, and five uh, uh, listed ocean oceanographic technicians to support it. And so that was kind of the birth of, of uh, the oceanography program, uh, you know, in uh, for the Coast Guard. And uh, that board that we talked about before in the other slide would say, "Hey, we need a dedicated uh, cruise uh, to Greenland." to really understand the other side of this uh, story. They asked for a vessel in 1927. There was no vessel available. 1928, Marion becomes available. And that would be because the fleet was expanding so much uh, because of the, the, you know, the drug, or, or I mean, the, the war on rum in, uh, because of prohibition. So this is a quote from Edward Smith, you know, from Iceberg Smith that says, now is the time. You know, uh, when, when we're getting ready to go on this expedition, we really under, need to understand where the iceberg come from, how they make that trip around, uh, you know, Baffin Bay and, and, and down the coast of Newfoundland and end up uh, in the shipping lanes because from one year to the next, it's all different. And we just don't really understand what it takes to get them around there and to finally uh, meet uh, the Gulf Stream and uh, melt naturally. So ocean currents is a what this is about. Uh, there was other oceanographic work that was done that was very important. Um, they did uh, bottom studies. They you know they took samples off the bottom, but really it was trying to come up and they did a lot of bathymetry too to do some charting improvements. But it was really about understanding why and how icebergs were calved off the coast of, of the glaciers of Greenland and ended up making their way into the shipping lanes. And that mission still continues today. And it would propel oceanographic efforts for the Coast Guard for decades. And that is still the impetus of, of any significant work really that the Coast Guard is doing uh, for, for, for oceanography today. I mean, we've taken oceanography to another step. We use it for search and rescue. We do, do all those kinds of things, but really, um, you know, oceanography in the Coast Guard has been driven by the requirements of the International Ice Control, Ice Patrol mission. So the vessel, uh, Marion was a, a buck and a quarter, 125 foot patrol boat built to win the, 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 uh, the, the rum war at sea. And they were specifically designed to have the endurance and the speed uh, to follow motherships uh, the way that the uh, rum runners basically work was have a large vessel offshore. You have a uh, smaller vessels running the drugs or the drugs. It, it, it's uh, I'm telling you my times here to run the rum in and out of uh, of the shore. And so they would um, uh, 
they built a specific class of vessel that was capable of tagging these motherships. And, uh, but they weren't designed to be oceanographic vessels. They proved their worth uh, with the Marion. One of the interesting things about them, uh, they were relatively new, you know, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. They, the Marion was home ported in New London, Connecticut. Um, uh, Base four in New London was one of the hubs uh, of the war on, uh, on rum because of uh, Boston and New York and all the things that were going on there. With that. That's a whole nother story. So she was designed for a crew of 20, uh, three officers and 17 enlisted. They sailed with four officers, two of which were warrants, 23 enlisted. They would lose one of those guys along the way from injury, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, one of the big things is they only had a 1500 gallon water tank. Uh, so for a deployment of, uh, and no evaporator. So for a deployment of this many months, uh, you know, obviously you gotta, you, you gotta come up with water and that would become uh, part of the story. Uh, they also had a coal fired boiler and a coal fired stove. Uh, in the galley, and so you had to carry bags of coal and uh, to go along with this uh, trip as well as fuel. For the fuel side, they could put 55 gallon drums on the on the fantail. Uh, for the coal side, they would store extra bags of coal in the forward hole. They also took all of the oceanographic winches, uh, the green Bigelow bottles, which we'll talk about more, uh, from Cutter Mojave and Cutter Modoc, who had been on the 1928 uh, International Ice Patrol uh, mission and all of the spares that they could possibly carry. One of the things with the Bigelow bottles and the winches is that typically at the end of the ice patrol season, those would have gone ashore and been maintained and repaired and had all their preventative maintenance done. Now they just transferred them over in Boston to Marion and away they went. And that would cause, uh, that would cause some issues in the, in the expedition as it went along. So let's talk about the crew. First of all, uh, the CO, Lieutenant Commander Edward Iceberg Smith. Uh, again, a guy who was born in uh, Vineyard Haven, you know, out on the out of Martha's Vineyard, uh, descended from a long line of whalers. Um, he was in the great class of 1913 uh, from the Revenue Cutter School of Instruction, now the Coast Guard Academy. His classmates included Elmer Stone, uh, you know, the you know aviator number one. C.C. Van Paulsen, who was also a renowned aviator, and all, and he was uh, he was also a, a great ice navigator and well-known guy as far as uh, as driving ships in in, uh, in in ice and in the Arctic, and uh, and then Fletcher Brown, uh, you know, one of the heroes of uh, of World War One. But uh, for my money, pound for pound, man, the class of 1913, you'd, you'd work hard to find a. A, a different class uh, or a better class that had as much influence on the history of, of the Coast Guard. So he, but Edward Smith was truly a pioneer uh, in, the, in, in physical oceanography. Physical oceanography was um, a science that kind of came in its own at the very end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. And these were the days before satellites when you could look down on the whole ocean, you're trying to understand a little block of the ocean, you're putting, you're gathering data and you're creating this little vertical block and you're stacking it next to all of the other blocks. And that's how, um, you know, the science community would uh, come to understand the ocean, understand the ocean currents, the influence. Obviously sailors knew um, about ocean currents for, for hundreds of years, but it was sort of thought of as a sailor art, right? And, but why it happened, was a little more nuanced. And that's, this is when the science community would really get involved. Um, and, you know, I think Smith, one of the things that, you know, you have to point to is that he's one of the few guys in, in the world who has a building uh, named after him on the, at the, on the campus of the Coast Guard Academy, as well as a building, a building named after him at the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So that kind of sings out to uh, how much of, uh, a point man this guy was when it comes to physical oceanography. And for me, he's one of my, my personal Coast Guard heroes. I learned a lot of, about leadership just from studying this guy. He's uh, an amazing personality, an amazing Coast Guard officer. So a quick picture of the crew. And they look like, uh, you know, crewmen of that time period. 
and uh, and you know, uh, I, I love this picture. If you count it, there's not enough of them there. They picked some of the guys up in Boston, but it's still a it's still a great picture. The XO uh, Lieutenant Noble Ricketts uh, is is probably as important to the success of this thing as ever. He relieved um, Iceberg Smith at, at after the 1927 uh, iceberg season. He sailed as the uh, as the you know officer, uh, the, the science officer uh, for that season. So and he volunteered to go on this mission. So he he just come off of months of transferring from cutter to cutter to cutter, stu studying icebergs, and now he's gonna you know get in away for uh, you know two and a half month you know, trip to the Greenland, but he was obviously very interested in this, and uh, he would be the guy who uh, wrote uh, much of the report that chronicles this, including the the description of the voyage, which almost reads like a, um, you know, reads like, uh, you know, an, an adventure story, so it's, it would make a great novel. So, we're underway. Marion departs expedition uh, departs on the expedition from New London on July seventh, nineteen twenty eight. The first thing they would do is make a call in the CO's uh, hometown in Vineyard Haven, and this was a pattern with uh, Smith, uh, even when he was uh, uh, driving the four stack uh, World War One vintage uh, uh, destroyers that were enforcing the. Rum war at sea, he would find reasons to end up in uh, end up in Vineyard Haven, and he would become a incredibly popular figure and well known figure uh, in his hometown for the re for the rest of his life. From there, they would sail to Boston, and from Boston, they would do that final prep, load oil, load all of that gear that we talked about, uh, get the extra crew on board, and then off to Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, and then thanks to Sydney, Nova Scotia, to kind of pick the brains of the folks that they would run into, their fishermen and other folks who knew what they were gonna encounter when they got into the Labrador Sea. Uh, one of the questions that sings out to this is like, hey, so prohibition's going on in America, and let's face it, Canada was one of the key smugglers of uh, uh, illicit uh, alcohol into, uh, in, into the US. So it must've been kind of fun to be a sailor I mean, you couldn't drink on the ship, don't get me wrong, but it must be kind of fun to go into, uh, into, uh, into Halifax. It's a great Liberty port, so is Sydney. So, you know, ooh-ha, get a little kickoff before you head into the, uh, into the uh, coast of Greenland. So from there, they depart Sydney, Nova Scotia, and they head across uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, transfer, transit the, the Straits of Belle Isle. And for many of the cruises, this is the first time they, they, see, they see an iceberg. And the, the picture on the right kind of captures uh, the whole cruise. You'll see more of that as we go in. So first stop, back to that whole small water tank thing, they stop in Battle Harbor, Labrador, and they take on fresh water the old fashioned way. You know, they nose the bow in and uh, form a bucket brigade and uh, fill it up. And this is the time where in the report, it lists that they also had additional open tanks that they carried on the fantail. And they say it's for, for washing Clothes, but you've got to understand that there's no showers on this particular ship. So I'm sure that there were uh, freshwater, uh, there's saltwater showers followed by, uh, you know, on the fantail, followed by, you know, rinsing out the salt water with the whatever. But you got to remember we're going to a uh, pretty cold place. So that probably wasn't that much of an option either. So from there, they encounter one of those uh, interesting storms. If you've ever uh, done Ocean Station or sailed the North Atlantic, you know that. Uh, uh, the storms in that part of the world are uh, you know, pretty nasty. So the first thing you do is ans anchor uh, in uh, Spotted Island Harbor in Labrador to wait out a storm. And this is the first place that uh, they kill and eat some seals. And uh, in the, the crew's uh, uh, opinion on this is if you cook it right, it's okay. And they would continue to hunt um, as Arctic explorers has done for generations, hunt uh, wildlife uh, to supplement their diet. So you're going to see all these dots on this chart, and those indicate um, oceanographic stations along the way. So a quick primer on oceanographic stations, and we don't have time to go into those kinds of detail, but what you see here is as uh, Iceberg Smith 
holding a green Bigelow bottle. Behind him is the, the, the bridge of the, you know, so it's the wheelhouse of the Marion. You can see the racks off to his left of additional Bigelow, big, green Bigelow bottles. Basically the bottle is, uh, has the ability to take a sample of water at depth. And it also has a reversing uh, thermometer. So it records the temperature at that depth and it's frozen on the thermometer so that you know what it was when they went down. You put multiple of these bottles on a wire and you can send them down to take, uh, take samples of depth. So here's some pictures actually from uh, the report. You can see the, where the Marion has had that extra deck added uh, activist bridge with a, you know, a boom and the winches are off to the inboard side so they can actually rig the bottles on the cable and send it down. And what happens is they pick the depths that they want to take the recordings of. And at this little, where it says operation of a Nansen bottle, the Nansen bottle is a, a different version of this, of the same capability. And you would drop a weight down that cable. It would trigger the thermometer and the bottle to basically flip over and reverse and take a sample of the water and record the temperature. And again, we, we don't have time to go into a lot of the details of that, of that process. But from here, they're off to make their first big run across uh, the Labrador Sea. And uh, the goal was, uh, was with Godhob and uh, 575 miles of stations. And you can see all the dots. And you can see all the stations that they took. But along the way, they actually had winch problems. Um, again, the winches not being getting their usual uh, preventative maintenance after the season would cause them issues, you know, on and off during the whole course of this thing, but they were able to overcome them all. But they requested permission to spend a little more time in, in Godhob so that they could repair the winch, but it made for a good and interesting port, port call. So they run into fog, which is also a problem in this part of the world, uh, but it did enable the crew to catch uh, a lot of really uh, nice cod. And uh, you know, hey, if you haven't had fresh cod cut right out of the, uh, you know, the Grand Banks or or points north, uh, it's it's a delicacy. It's a delicacy. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So that was the other thing they did for the course of the of the trip was to catch uh, fish and to supplement supplement the, the food stores that they had taken along. So they land in uh, in Gatab, and uh, now uh, so. In Greenland, a lot of the places have been uh, renamed uh, to reflect the Iliut language. This one is Nuuk, and uh, Nuuk is a nice, easy one. Most of the other ones aren't, so I am not going to even try to pronounce the Greenland pronunciations. Uh, but it, uh, it, you know, it is interesting. Uh, the good thing about uh, Gatab, and, and that'll become important later in the Greenland Patrol when, uh, again, when the Coast Guard is involved in that, but. Um, you know, it is the, the district capital. It's also the capital of the southern part of Greenland. If you were going to divide Greenland into three uh, states, if you will, there's like a North Greenland, a South Greenland, and a Northeast Greenland. And that's kind of about it. And then there are various districts within that. Um, so they're, you're arriving in a foreign country. So they fire their uh, appropriate 21 gun salute. They make ready to repair the winch. Uh, the winch. They grant liberty to the, to the crew. And uh, the, the, the township hosts a community dance, which will become a, you know, kind of a common practice as they, as they move around through, uh, through Greenland. But this is a great picture uh, from uh, their stop in, in Gatab. And uh, I love the, the guy in the back uh, with, the, with the big cigar. I'm not sure where he got the cigar, but it's still a cool picture. But uh, you get a feel for um, the clothing and, uh, and at the time. One of the interesting things in the report is that uh, the XO, uh, Lieutenant Ricketts finds, it, finds the place fascinating. It says, you know, hey, it's very restricted. The Danes have a, you know, really have this place pretty well locked down. And so he's going, hey, this would be a great tourist destination, which is kind of funny for, for 1928, but, but he, he has that language in, in the report. Uh, but the Danes, when you look at colon European colonialism, uh, Greenland would be, a, it's an interesting study because the Danes have spent hundreds of years protecting uh, the native population from 
the evils, I guess, of outside influence, including all through World War II. So from there, they head for the big thing. This is the big deal for this cruise. They head for Gotthaven and they head into Disco Bay. And that's where you're finding uh, the glaciers that are key uh, to um, uh, the icebergs are gonna end up reaching the shipping lanes. So, and again, they take a, a line of, uh, of soundings. All of the quotes that you see in these slides are from the report written by the XO. And I apologize that we have to move too quickly to meet our time schedule here, but it will be recorded. You can go back and watch the recording and maybe read a little more of the, of the information that's in there. But all these are from uh, you know, the XO's language that he put in when he uh, wrote the report. So we get into Disco Bay, and this is, this is kind of the, this is the hub of what they were really looking for. Um, you know, while they were there, they were able to hook up with uh, the, the, uh, Nor the Danish uh, scientists that had been there for a long time. The Danes maintained an Arctic station there. They were monitoring, uh, you know, iceberg calving and, and scientific information. So, you know, basically Iceberg spent, the, spent a lot of time, every, everything he could, you know, talking with those folks that were there and gained a, a lot of information about what was going on in Disco Bay and how that was gonna influence uh, iceberg calving. And he would carry that into uh, the future exploration that he would do. So, so here's, uh, you know, they're, they're there, they're in Disco Bay, they're looking at the face of a glacier, you know, and who can resist, right? You break out the three inch gun, fire a few rounds into a glacier, see what the heck's gonna happen. And, uh, you know, for the most part, it didn't do very much. And if we, 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 we later in the 50s did, and 60s did more uh, iceberg destruction experiments. You can find out there's like nothing short of a nuclear explosion that's gonna bother an iceberg. So, but they did found this, but they were fascinated by the natural calving process that occurred all the time. And, you know, the roar of, of new icebergs being birthed there uh, in, the, in Disco Bay. So here's the place where now it's uh, kind of time to start working our way a little bit farther south. And so, they are in there, they're gonna wrap this thing up and they're gonna anchor off of the, uh, you know, off of there. And it's like, hey, we're as far north as any Coast Guard vessel has been on this side of the North American continent. So in the traditions of Arctic explorers forever, they build a cairn, right? A stack of rocks with information and put a three inch shell casing on top of it, commemorating uh, the fact that they were there. And this is, the, this is as far north as a Coast Guard vessel has ever gotten on this side of the North American line. And then it's time to stop back and uh, in, uh, get that fuel that was uh, you know, kind of promised and, and uh, do some more interaction with the, the local populace and a great picture here of them uh, holding another one of those uh, community dances. So they also uh, you know, got back to Godhaven pick up that fuel that was promised, pick up their water, and they're challenged to a soccer game. And, uh, you know, so soccer wasn't, isn't a great, you know, a incredibly great sport here in America. It's gotten much better. But in 1928, they probably didn't have any idea what was going on. And they later find out that the radio operator in uh, Gotthaven is a, an accomplished soccer player from, you know, of some of note, in, in, in Denmark, and uh, he had been coaching the local team. So yeah, 26 to nothing, uh, not a good day for the Americans, right? So yeah, no gold medal there. So now they start working back and the goal was to get to uh, Cape Deer and get as close in. And they start to run into um, the ice pack and uh, they can't really make it to where they're going because, because of the ice pack. And this is kind of interesting because uh, this would kind of trigger a thought in Iceberg Smith's mind that the ice pack would hold uh, icebergs traveling around Baffin Bay and down the coast, the ice pack along the coast would hold them out and, and keep them moving and keep them from running aground. He would later be able to kind of prove that theory uh, in 1936 in another report based on some of the other research that he would do later. But the ice pack stops them, so they kind of keep working, working south. But this is where uh, the, our polar bear comes in. Um, 
you know, they were hunting uh, food, uh, you know, fresh meat. Uh, there was walrus on the ice. A shot a walrus. Uh, walrus goes into the water before it can be recovered. Where well, there are three large polar bears, uh, a mom and a couple cubs. So they were able to uh, uh, kill the two polar bears, two of the polar bears with rifles, and uh, the, the the third one, the other cub, they were able to recover live and and bring aboard the ship. The the bears that they shot would become food for the rest of the rest of the trip. And you can imagine trying to bring a 200 pound polar bear aboard a 125 foot vessel uh, when it was angry. So I did manage to get it into the hold and, uh, and secured it in the forward hold and put the hatch down and just let the bear kind of run around in there as much as it could. And the other two bears would be uh, brought aboard, butchered and would be meat for the rest of the, the, rest of the trip. Um, you know, in modern day stuff, uh, yeah, but that's just the way things went uh, in the Arctic in that time. You hunted, you hunted uh, wildlife uh, to supplement your diet. Uh, you need a protein, that's the way it goes. So they left, they, they just kind of finally give up on trying to make it to uh, Baffin Island because of the ice and they start moving on uh, and continue their research to the south. It is this point where somebody decides it's kind of a cool idea that the bear might need light and air. So they raise this very heavy hatch and you know put the dogs out so there's a little air flow there. And of course the bear being a bear uh, decides that's a you know a, a avenue escape, uh, makes it onto the deck of the ship and then uh, the crew uh, has this uh, big for, I'd love to have like somebody with a video camera today on their phone. Uh, to capture these guys, uh, you know, trying to capture this little bear, little 200 plus pounds. <coughs> is, but anyway, they do subdue the bear, and there were some injuries, uh, not to the bear, and uh, but they they get it, and they decide that they better build a more substantial cage, that they can't just leave this thing down in the forward hold. They build a cage, and eventually the bear makes us back to the to the National Zoo in Washington D.C. So. Uh, there was a break in this uh, routine of oceanography when they get a, a typical Coast Guard call uh, to do basically a SAR case. They're supposed to look for a couple of aviators who were heading from uh, from Labrador to Newfoundland, and they thought they might be lost off of uh, Resolution Island. So you can see that kind of light gray pattern on the chart. That's where they did their uh, their search pattern. Didn't find anything. Turns out the guy made it safely to Greenland, so not a big deal. So from there, they go back across uh, the Labrador Sea one more time over to, uh, over to Greenland again. And one of the interesting facts is you know, they sail into the, uh, to the uh, Arsuk Ford and, um, at, at Ingvet, Ingvet, and they recorded 270 fathoms of depth. So that's 270 times six, uh, and the, the fjord's a, half, a mile and a half wide. So that's deep. That's really deep. So in uh, in, in, in Vigonut is where the is where the um, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. I always struggle with this one. That's where the uh, cryolite mine was, and cryolite uh, is an important element. It's essential element to the to, to aluminum, and that's one of the greatest resources in Greenland, and that will become really important. Uh, as we get into uh, the Greenland Patrol and why America invested the, the time, effort, and the Coast Guard resources uh, in defending the island. So from there, um, we're heading back south from Cape Farrell, which is, you know, the Cape Horn of, uh, of the north, uh, off the tip, very southern tip of Greenland. And they, they head south, they're going back over toward uh, the Straits of Belle Isle. Uh, but Iceberg Smith decides he needs to make a stop in St. John's just to resupply, take fresh water. So into St. John's they go. And again, this is the height of prohibition and uh, must have been kind of cool having spent quite a bit of time in St. John's. Uh, great Liberty Port, uh, probably a good stop for the crew. And then the stretch run. They head into uh, in in you know into Nantucket Sound, make another stop in uh, the boss's uh, home there in Vineyard Haven, 
And he's got this polar bear on the fantail and all of these uh, articles from his trip to Greenland. And so uh, they stop that day, they get a lot of visitors. The next day they bring the school kids down to look at the polar bear. Uh, must have been a quite event in, uh, in Vineyard Haven. And then finally a, a stretch run into New Orleans or into New, uh, London for their, to their home station. But I gotta thank, uh, I gotta thank uh, my good friend, Lori Friel for this picture. This is one of her granddad's pictures of base four uh, in, in New London when, uh, you know when the when the one twenty fives and the destroyers and the and the six bitters and all that kind of stuff were there there in London. It's a great picture. It's one of the best pictures that I could I could find. So the seventy three day cruise is finally ended, and the bear is off on a train headed for the zoo in Washington D.C. So total of eight thousand one hundred miles. Uh, again, a distance from New York to Sydney. Uh, the 450,000 square miles uh, of area that they surveyed, uh, 191 stations, those oceanographic stations, all those dots with 2,000 plus observations. That's a multiple observations in each station. They registered, the bathymetry was a big part of this as well. And they registered a 1,700 depth per chart record, as well as many of the, obviously the bathometers running, uh, you know, almost continually during that, that time. So, uh, so we have made our way from New London uh, to above the Arctic Circle and back to New London. So that kind of ends my presentation. The thing off to the left is a copy of the front cover that the, the report was published uh, in two volumes, one in 1931 and one in 1932. Uh, part one was uh, authored by the XO. Uh, and and uh, the uh, sediment part of it was uh, authored by uh, Parker D. Trusk, who was a renowned um, geologist with, uh, with uh, um, the USGS. And then the other one, part two, was Iceberg Smiths. Uh, and it was a, a 212 pages, I think, uh, of all of the uh, oceanographic information that he, uh, that he read. So with that, I end mine and I ran five minutes over, I think from my 30 minute time uh, window, but I will open it back up for, uh, for questions. Well, thank you very much, Bob. We appreciate uh, that presentation. Um, I was not aware of a polar bear that went to the National Zoo. And since I live in DC, I'm gonna have to find out uh, exactly what happened to that bear. Yeah, the bear story is pretty interesting. Um, you know, it, it lived out a good life. It turned out there was a female. And uh, this is a different time from a zoo management than as well as a lot of things that happened in modern times. They actually put her and another female polar bear in with a male Kodiak. And they actually produced some hybrids, which is a little weird these days, but was a big popular attraction in the 1930s. So I can I wonder, you know, you talked a little bit about the uh, reconfiguration of the ship so that uh, she could have a crane for doing the dips with the uh, gathering of the weather and such. Do we know how much of their experiences in the layout of the ship and the construction of the ship that led to other ships being outfitted for that? I know uh, in 1964, the Cutter Evergreen, which was a converted 180 foot buoy tender was converted into uh, WAGO, Oceanographic and spent two decades as that. And the Healy is now sailing as a uh, scientific laboratory medium icebreaker. Um, did some of Marion's experiences go into how those things were designed and, and followed on with? Absolutely. I mean, they, they had um, added that extra oceanographic winches and that uh, deck that would go over the side so you could have a straight down uh, line on your, on your oceanographic uh, uh, instruments, you know, so you could have the cable running pretty much straight up and down if you could. That had been added to ships that were doing ice patrol, and then Marion adding it to that that small ship and all of the things that they learned from that. Uh, the General Green would would another one would uh, 125 that would follow. You know, they would improve that, and uh, again, as they went on, like the uh, the 327s and the 311s and other ships that did Ocean Station. They would take those lessons learned and the, those would be added to those ships. 
And when they designed the 378s originally, they all came out with a, a Oceano Lab uh, and a balloon shelter and that same instruments were on there. So from you look at the 125s and what they learned from Marion Expedition, when they built the, their 378s all those years later in the, you know, the, the uh, late 60s, 1970s, that all of that information would be built right into those vessels, as well as, as you say, Evergreen, uh, you know, she was, she was built with that same thing. And uh, Healy, uh, you know, is the nirvana of that. Uh, and don't get me started on why. I, I, love, I love the story of Mike Healy uh, being an um, um, Iceberg Smith fan. I always thought it should have been the Cutter Smith, but that's me. And interestingly, you talk about the 378s. They uh, just retired the last 378 last week, uh, which kind of gives you a timeline for things. Um, and I think some of our uh, visitors might be interested to know is the 125-foot uh, cla active class of cutters that the Marion represented uh, served until 1978 in the Coast Guard. Uh, so they had a pretty good long life cycle. They did. I mean, and they only lost three um, uh, over the whole course of their history, uh, two of them in a hurricane uh, during World War II, and then, of course, uh, the tragedy of the, of the Cuyahoga. But yeah, and we talked about, when I talked about uh, expanding the crew, uh, come World War II, uh, with all the added weaponry and uh, requirements uh, for anti-submarine warfare, they would up the crew to 46 people. So uh, I'm sure that Folks on Marion felt that they were pretty crowded for this uh, 73 G three journey, but they wouldn't get any sympathy from the guys who served on them in World War II. Uh, absolutely. I, I served as a commanding officer of a 110-foot vessel with half the crew size, and I know how compact that was. Um, so I would suggest to our audiences, they may want to uh, imagine living with that many people in a, roughly 1,000 square feet. Um, <laughs> so think, think about what size your house is. And then figure that and realize there were no showers included in that. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it's a, it, even up to World War II, they never added showers, which is, uh, you know, pretty interesting. So, yeah, today's sailor probably would think, what? You know, so, yeah. So, Bob, if you if you don't mind, uh, I've unlocked everybody's uh, microphone so that they can ask some questions uh, if they want to. So. If we have people in the audience who would like to ask a question, unmute yourself and try not to step on each other. We have a small enough crowd. I think we can do it without uh, any issue. Question for you. I, I noticed you talked about oceanographics. Coast and Genetic Survey, when did they come in and when did they take over all this? So, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Geodetic Survey had been around for, for a really long time. Where Coast Guard oceanography really started to fade a little bit was uh, with the birth of NOAA. Uh, NOAA would be one of the things that would influence the Coast Guard, uh, as well as budgetary, budgetary issues to get out of the hardcore uh, oceanographic business. I would say that the 1960s were the heyday uh, of oceanography, um, and it would kind of fade, it would kind of fade after that, and it would also fade with, uh, you know, uh, but but it's always been a combined thing. You had the, you know, you you had the, um, uh, you know, so you have USGS and they, you know, there were Coast Guard vessels under sail that would be or revenue cutter vessels under sail that would be detailed to the USGS because they're doing charting, and um, they were the experts. And it's always been a partnership between them and the Revenue Cutter Service and later later the Coast Guard. Uh, from the charting standpoint, the hardcore oceanography stuff that, that, you know, the, and again, the, the international ice patrol still exists. They're still doing, um, you know, significant oceanographic studies, but the USGS has been around for a really long time. So to say, when did that happen? Um, uh, you know, you'd have to go back to uh, the very early days of the existence of both organizations. Uh, both the, the Revenue Cutter Service and the USGS, and they've existed for a real long time because they've had this shared mission on charting. And that's why the, that's why the guy from the USGS wrote, uh, co-authored, or actually authored the part on the sediment study uh, from the Marion Expedition because the Coasties had taken all that data, but he was the guy who was the scientist who actually knew what to do with that data and write, write it up. Thank you. And, 
you know, but still, I mean, the bathymetry part of it, you know, the, which feeds into the USGS side too, they're correcting charts and issuing charts and doing all of those kinds of things, um, which was later transitioned to NOAA. NOAA took that mission as well. That part of it was being done by the coast, uh, you know, uh, you know, Lieutenant Ricketts wrote that part of the report about all of the, the bathymetry information that would update scores of charts along the coast of Greenland, which would become essential uh, once we got into uh, the, the Greenland patrol area during World War II. I'd love for you to do something on the ocean stations that we had during the 1960s. Before the satellites went up, we stayed out there for a long time. Oh yeah, the ocean stations are a fascinating story. Maybe I, I'll put that on my list. I show I showed the prequel sequel. I mean, I, I hope to at some point in the future put together, uh, some, you know, a birth of the ice patrol one because it's um, there's a lot of political nuances that go along with that as well as the the other stuff. I mean, I talked about uh, you know Admiral Bertoff and when he was one, on the U.S. delegation to the very first Safety at Life at sea convention that would give birth to ice patrol. He was the guy who pushed it for the revenue cutter service to take it uh, after the Navy said that we don't have a ship to go out or ships to go, ship to go out uh, in 1913. And then again, he would use that uh, mission uh, really to save the Coast Guard a couple of times, save the revenue cutter service the first time to create the Coast Guard. And then set that but Iceberg Smith, back to Ocean Station, Arsberg Smith was one of the guys who really pushed for uh, mid-ocean weather stations uh, in, the, in the 1940s, basically okay. starting in 1940, that would become the Ocean Station mission. So he's also, he's also the godfather of Ocean Stations for those who were on Ocean Station. So yeah, yeah. It's been a long time out there. Yeah. So Jay, we have a we have a list going forward of topics we want to see covered. Ocean Station was on it. If you're willing to pre uh, present, we can help you. <laughs> well, I don't know about presenting, but I'd certainly be interested in getting involved in it. Fascinating. Had a good all right, time. Well, still have memories in my head after all these years. Then we may read if we can get a presenter, we will reach out to you and make sure we cover your story too. Sure. I know Bob Bonneville is also looking at that topic, so maybe we can uh, get enough people with the information together. We'll present that one month. Yeah, you know, one of the things he talked about was off of Greenland, and I was up on a station there off Greenland in the wintertime, and the waves were incredible. I'll never forget that. It was beautiful, but wow. Seemed to be very violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my days, my days on ice patrol, having, having done an ocean station, uh, my days on ice patrol, I, uh, uh, you know, we're doing our reconnaissance from an aircraft and I used to be very thankful sometimes when I was flying over uh, that piece of the ocean that I was looking down at it from, uh, from above. So yeah, it can, it can be, you know, the, again, the, you know, the Grand Banks are uh, incredible. All right. Do we have any more questions of the captain? Uh, yes, I have one. Uh, First of all, Captain, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, my question: So I've I've heard that Iceberg Smith got the nickname Iceberg uh, because of the Marion Expedition and because of his uh, work on iceberg formation. Did you figure out a point at which he actually picked up that nickname? Was it uh, was it during the expedition or was it uh, sometime afterward? It was prior to that. Um, he, he picked a moniker up from his. Uh, you know, his cohorts, you know, particularly his classmates, um, when he was, uh, you know, detailed as the, as the science officer, you know, starting in uh, 1922, 23 uh, period, where he's just, where he's the guy who starts the thing where he just transferred from ship to ship to ship, um, you know, to make sure that he maintained continuity of his, of his information during the course of the season. And so, there's all these guys on these uh, ships that are doing ice patrol stuff and they're like, Oh, iceberg Smith's coming aboard. Right. You know, so, um, because, you know, these guys, you know, the guys that are detailed to ice patrol, you know, they're, they're Cutterman and they're like, you know, Hey, oh, that's iceberg Smith. So he picked the moniker up in that, that period from 1920 through like 
27 or and that's where he kind of became famous and uh um he was also a very popular figure you know in the news media and those kinds of things because that's you know there's a great fascination on iceberg but it was actually ahead of the 1928 uh expedition they would really pick up the moniker so oh cool interesting yeah he's uh he's a very fascinating figure i uh i I do also wish they had uh, they'd named a ship after him, but you know, I mean, uh, naming a ship Coast Guard Cutter Smith obviously sounds a little bit bland. Uh, but still, you know, it's uh, uh, there's so many different stories about him. You know, from uh, I, the Marion Expedition, I think is the one that you know I and before that, I think is the one that I'd known the least about. Um, but I know that you know after that, he went on to. Uh, he went on a, on a science expedition on a uh, on the Graf Zeppelin, um, a German blimp that went to the North Pole, um, which was actually also very fascinating because that was a uh, another sort of little geopolitical uh, incident where the the Russians and the Germans had some rival claims at the North Pole, and so sending their science expedition was a way of of sort of showing off that they had uh, they had the ability to get there, and he was brought along as the science observer, which. Uh, you know, there's a little piece that um, uh, Dr. William Thiessen wrote on it uh, from the Atlantic Area Historian's Office. Uh, but he's just such a fascinating figure. And I, I really, you know, it's like the Coast Guard has a, a biography of Sinbad the dog and not Edward Iceberg Smith, which I, I think is a real tragedy. So thank you for, for helping to fill in this little, uh, the, this little piece. This was, this was great. Yeah, I've, I've always said, and again, it's like, you know, taking on writing a book is a, a, a challenge. And, but I've always said, and, uh, you know, I, my poor wife has heard this a thousand times. If I was going to write that first book uh, as a history geek, it would be the comprehensive biography of Iceberg Smith. Um, I mean, I think the guy deserves it. And, you know, when I talked about him being a pioneer in oceanography, I mean, we're not just talking about the Coast Guard. I mean, he is revered uh, in the physical oceanography world as one of those guys that was out on point. And, if, you know, if you have a laboratory named after you at Woods Hole, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's you know, that's a testimonial on its own. And it is a fascinating story. And he became, you know, you're talking about the, the, geo, the political side of the Graf Zeppelin thing. And then, you know, he's kind of in on the, the Grima Patrol, which has a whole nother political side too. Um, so it, yeah, you know, it's it, he, an amazing guy. Um, like I said, I, I, I wrote an article, I don't know, back in 2005, was something about the walking in the footsteps of a hero. I, I, I just learned a lot about leadership uh, from, from just studying the guy. So, yep. 